Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most compassionate, and may his peace and blessings be upon our dear beloved messenger Muhammad and upon his family and his companions and all those who sincerely just try uh, to follow his example until the last day. Um, my name is Aaron, a.k.a. Harun Sellers. Um, alhamdulillah, I accepted Islam in 1994. And um, currently, I uh, work at Zaytuna College at the top of a mountain in Berkeley, California. Alhamdulillah, America's first accredited Muslim liberal arts college. I'm a father of four daughters. And so far, my wife hasn't given up on me, so alhamdulillah, 25 years so far, <laughs> alhamdulillah. How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah. I think that's that, that fasting, alhamdulillah, like, alhamdulillah. Yeah, we're in that, that last hour, so <laughs> if anybody nods off, I'm not going to take it personally, it's, it's okay. Alhamdulillah. Who's, uh, who here, it's their very first Ramadan, anybody? Oh, subhanAllah, two people. Alhamdulillah. First Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. How about anybody, this is their second or third, like first to fifth. This is your second? And then what about you? Second? Third? Okay. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Fifth and what? You raised your hand, I think, sister? Sixth, okay, alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. All praise and thanks be to Allah who brung us to another one, inshallah. Get another one under our belt. We pray that we go all the way to the end and cross the finish line, inshallah, so we can eat, drink, and praise the Lord like the Prophet ﷺ commanded us. And I was so happy to read that hadith, like literally commanding us to eat, drink, and praise the Lord. So alhamdulillah, we'll, we'll make it to do that. Um, considering this is the hour, you know, that that kind of nerve-wracking hour uh, before breaking the fast, I'll try to keep this light and, and very open and easy on everybody, inshallah. No quizzes. Um, but it's, it's, really, uh, it's, it's really something to be really thankful for, um, that you're able to fast and break your fast attached to some type of community and with some type of knowledge. Is there anybody here who experimented with fasting uh, before they accepted Islam? Raise your hand. Oh, okay. Several people. And so for those who raised your hand, maybe yourself, sister, um, how did you come to do that? Like, how did you know Muslims fasted? And like, how did you even know how to fast? Okay. Okay. So was it was it like a book or somebody told you like, hey, here's how you fast? Okay. Well, how did, how did you find out, like, how do you do this Muslim fasting? Like, was it through her or, or like, a you read an article or a book? Okay, alhamdulillah. 
Awesome. Okay, excellent. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. Anybody else? How did you, who, I forgot else, who else raised their hand that they tried fasting for, how did you find out about it? Yeah. deep yeah yeah okay one more person who experimented how was okay Right. May Allah reward them. They did their best. That's all Allah asked for. Just do your best. So may Allah reward them for every fast you've done since then. They get a big portion of that, inshallah. That, that's really beautiful. Well, myself, I also, I'm asking that question because I also experimented with fasting before, like signing up, you know, uh, to be a Muslim. And um, I thought I would share a poem that I wrote um, about that experience. <laughs> So I was very impacted by it. So I wrote this uh, on my break at work, uh, since I wasn't taking the typical uh, lunch break uh, that day. But I actually, once I would, this was in a period where I was investigating Islam, and I knew that Muslims fasted. So I said, "Yeah, let me give it a try and see what that's like." And I also convinced my friend, um, my friend Chris. Who was, all, who was actually the guitarist in the alternative rock band that I was the lead singer in at the time. So he thought it was a, a cool alternative idea uh, to try. And so we were like, we picked a day and we said, okay, we're going to fast on this day. And um, so what I wrote is, feeling kind of dizzy because of the fast, but I've got to make it. No, I'm sorry. My head is spinning. There we go. My head is spinning. The first line is literally, my head is spinning. And I think we can all relate with that first line. <laughs> my head is spinning. How long will I last? Feeling kind of dizzy because of the fast. But I've got to make it. I've got to take it. Try not to fake it. Try not to break it. Because I believe I shall receive what I'm looking for if I break through the door. Again and again I bow and nod, humbling myself to the will of God. Because what I want to know might not be shown. God has keys to knowledge unknown. I'm out for my own when I make the endeavor. Some say I'm stupid. Some say I'm clever. Some people think I'm wasting my time. But their soul's theirs and my soul's mine. Sometimes I think that I'll wait until I'm dead. But every single day, it burns in my head. It permeates my thoughts, permeates my dreams. Sometimes I feel like the product of a scheme. But I don't want to wait until I'm dead. To know what I want to know, I want to know now instead. I owe it to my soul to try. Some wonder why I'm on the level I'm on. I'm coming from the Bible and then the Quran. Two great books, one short, one long. But one says words and the other are wrong. It says that the words we have now are residual. Seems kind of right because I can't find the original. But I don't want a man to tell me what to do. So I'm waiting for my Lord to guide me through. 
And so that was literally a song that we recorded in the group called The Fasting Song. So the, the interesting uh, unwritten conclusion to that scenario was, so Chris picked me up from work, and his head was spinning too. <laughs> and, you know, it was a nine to five, so we still had some time to go. And we went back to his house, and uh, we're all, of course, obsessing over what we're going to eat, you know, when we break our fast. And being two single musicians, the only thing we could come up with was some ramen noodles, some oodles and noodles. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to have some oodles and noodles. And, um, and so we're just waiting, talking, kind of reflecting, spacing out, uh, heads increasingly spinning even more and more. And it got to the point I remember, and that's what's interesting even about kind of sitting on the floor like this. We started kind of like walking around this house and stuff, and then we went to sitting in the chair, and then we ended up like sitting on the floor like this, and then we ended up like on our sides like this. Just literally there was one of these big circular clocks on like the opposite wall. And I just remember how long we stared at that clock. And we were just waiting until 12.01, midnight. Because I thought you didn't break your fast to the next day. That's what I thought. Muslims fast, you know, 30 days. So I was like, okay. We're going to try that. And I didn't think you broke your fast the next day. And I swear that the time it took from the, the clock to go from 12 to 12.01, it seemed like an eternity. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when it finally was like, click, we're like, ah, oodles and noodles. You know, <laughs> we like attacked those noodles. They were like the best oodles and noodles I've ever had till this day. Alhamdulillah. So fast forward, um, we're at the uh, masjid uh, that I was advised to go to because uh, the sister told me, may God reward her. She said, if you want a free Quran, just go to this masjid in Falls Church, Dar Hijra Masjid. Um, I had been reading the Quran up to, you know, to that point, And then Chris, you know, he said he wanted to read some Quran too. So he kept borrowing my Quran and I got tired of that. And so I was like, dude, you need to get your own Quran. <laughs> And then the sister, mashallah, Aisha, who gave me my first Quran at the record store that I was working at, uh, to make a long story short, um, she said, hey, if you go to this mosque over here in Falls Church, not far away from where you guys live, they'll give you a free one. And I was like, and especially because the Quran is pretty thick with the Arabic and English, and I was like, they'll give me a free one of those? Cause that book looks expensive, you know? She's like, no, just go. I'm telling you, they'll give you a free one. So we go there. And alhamdulillah, the, the rec we walked in there with shorts and tank tops and earrings and everything. And the imam, mashallah, he came out. He was wearing a nice two-piece suit with pinstripes, very well-groomed, all gray hair. And he just smiled at us with this big smile. And he was like, sure, you can have a free Quran. And I was like, are you for real? Like, free, free? Like, F-R-E-E? -E? And he was like, and he laughed. And he was like, yes, but come talk to us first. You know, just let's sit in my office. And alhamdulillah, after a good conversation, a few other interesting events, uh, I signed up for Islam. You know, in that moment, I said, yeah, this is it. I took my shahada. Uh, Chris wasn't quite ready at that time, but he was very happy to get the free Quran. And I was very happy to get my Quran back uh, to continue the reading, alhamdulillah. And alhamdulillah, he did eventually, a couple months after that, accept Islam as well. And still my best friend till this day. Alhamdulillah, I wish he was right, right, right here with me, telling his side of the, the fasting song. <laughs> alhamdulillah. But I'm also saying that to say that, um, like, alhamdulillah for guidance and that we have teachers, you know. That's why we don't uh, want to do it yourself Islam. You know, you, this is a big blessing to see you all here in this situation, uh, attached to some type of community and learning how to fast well. And obviously, it's, it's a lifelong uh, effort, you know, fasting. It's not just, oh, you do it once or twice or 30 days and you're like a pro. You know, this has been, what, 28 years or so for me, and I'm still feeling like it's my first Ramadan. You know what I mean? 
but and I just wanted to just cover a couple, couple things uh, in in that regard. Uh, firstly, everybody by now has probably memorized that verse uh, in the Quran, from chapter two, verse one eighty three, where Allah says, "What may be translated as, O you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, that you may develop what." God consciousness. Alhamdulillah. This was very appealing to me as a convert. God saying that it was been prescribed for this community as it was prescribed for those before you. That really appealed to me as a Christian. I was familiar in, with the idea of fasting from the Bible, from the Gospel, from the Old Testament. You hear fasting 30 days, no fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Right? But there were no like really details uh, to that. So, but I really appreciate again as a convert this, this verse because it gave me a sense of continuity. But also it was a reminder um, that fasting is, is something that, that our Creator prescribed and it's something perennial. Like it's across human history, this spiritual practice of fasting. And that's something we should take some honor in that also we too now as a Muslim community and followers of the, the, the last of the prophets, peace be upon them, we get to partake in something that Allah has prescribed as a spiritual practice and a, a, a very distinct and unique way of spiritual development that's been going on, you know, since humans have been on the earth. And so we should also, it's a struggle, but that's a reminder we should feel a sense of honor in that struggle as well because it's not something that Allah just imposed on us to be, you know, strict, you know, with us. You know what I mean? Allah is not, a no, he's not an oppressor. He forbade him, himself from oppressing, oppression. So it's something when it feels hard, just remember that this is something that's been happening in humankind since the beginning. And we're just part of that continuance. And Sean, we pray that we're amongst those who, you know, keep it going, pass the baton uh, to those who are next, inshallah. In that regard, I did want to, especially since, I, like I said, I work at Zaytuna College with, in the company of many great teachers and, and great students as well. But one of our faculty members who some of you may have met or heard or seen, because he, he also lectures here occasionally, Dr. Ali Atai. Um, I recorded and shared a, a very profound lecture by him uh, on the Zaytuna College YouTube channel where he discusses and goes through fasting in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And he maps it out in a very brief format. And then uh, a year ago, th this video was maybe uh, six or seven years ago. Um, yeah, maybe about six years ago. But then last year, he did a, a podcast recording um, that I recorded with him at the college as well, where he expanded on that, and it's even like at length. He has a full episode on fasting in Judaism, full episode on fasting in Christianity, and a full episode on fasting in Islam. And it's really, really informative, and I think very, very beneficial um, as, a, as a convert. So if you just type in Zaytuna College, Ali Atai Fasting in YouTube, you should find it. If you type in uh, Zaytuna College podcast, Ali Atai, you should find it, inshallah. If not, you can definitely reach out to me as well as yourself. I can give you the direct links and you can share it you know, with the group. I think you would find, find that very enriching, inshallah. Um, next, from the Hadith, you know, our, the other source that, that we take uh, inspiration and, and, and guidance from, uh, the companion Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, he reported that Allah's messenger, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said what may be translated as, whoever observes fast during the month of Ramadan out of sincere faith and hoping to attain Allah's rewards, then all of his or her past sins will be forgiven. Now, that is a, I mean, God, like, what a deal. Like, all we have to do is just refrain, you know, not till 12 on 1 midnight, <laughs> right? 
We just got to refrain for a few hours, whatever that happens to be that season, right? And not just from food and drink, as we know. It's not just refraining from food and drink. It's also other actions and especially uh, character traits as well that we should be avoiding and also character traits that we should be bringing on. But all we have to do is just hang on, do that sincerely, you know, at the root of it, there has to be sincere sincerity in it. And um, for 30 days, and look what we get. Everything just wiped out like your newborn baby. And that's why they say the, 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 at the end of Ramadan, the only person that's not forgiven is the person who refused it. Isn't that something? At the end of Ramadan, the only person not forgiven is the person that just refused. That's how open and available Allah's forgiveness is during this month. And this particular hadith meant a lot to me too because it was a reminder that Jesus didn't have to die for me to, for God to forgive me. Didn't. Not at all. And even technically we know it's not, we're, it's not just literally by our actions uh, that we're forgiven as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us. And reminded us that we're forgiven by grace, ultimately. That we are commanded to be an upright community and be virtuous and get out there and act. And Ramadan is just one of those acts. But ultimately, we are forgiven by grace. And from his grace, he's given us a means. And from his grace, he didn't require that Prophet Jesus, who many of us, any of us, uh, I would, you know, who are anybody else from a Christian background, Right, that's the good news. Like, we know gospel means good news. Don't you think that's good news, that he didn't have to die for us to be forgiven? I think that is great news. And I think if you would have asked me, like, as like a checkbox or, or a choice, uh, whether God could forgive me, in order for God to forgive me, would Jesus have to die? Or God forgives me without him dying? What would you choose? And Allah gave us that. You know, and Ramadan is just one of them. You can get forgiven just giving salams to your fellow, you know, Muslims. Just spreading salams is a means of forgiveness. So many other things. Do this, do this, forgiven, forgiven. Do this, forgiven. Say this. Some things you just say it, and it's a means of, of forgiveness. Right? So alhamdulillah, what, what, what a blessing. and what, what, what a gift uh, we have to this. Um, and so it, it's been a, a blessing for me, yeah, fasting now for, for 28 years, but it did, um, at one point, it was kind of daunting, you know, when I really thought about what I'm doing for 30 days, and then I've done this, uh, you know, for over 20 years, you have to ask yourself, like, what's the result of that? Like, what's the impact of me doing something, especially in this day and time, like, that's something pretty significant. You know what I mean? To actually do something like a Ramadan in today's day and age. And that the whole purpose of it is to develop a, a closer relationship to God, a closer relationship uh, to your friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, right? It's not literally just for you, and let alone ultimately a through that, a closer relationship with, with God, right? Because fasting is easy to hide from people, you know, unless they're around you in that last 10 minutes, you know. <laughs> we start acting kind of off, and they ask you, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you, know, you know? But generally, it's pretty easy to, to hide, right? And that's what's so beautiful that specifically Allah says the reward of fasting is His, he will reward for it specifically with a specific uh, type of reward. Right? So alhamdulillah for fasting. It's tough, but alhamdulillah for fasting. But I went through a, a stage with it where I really was like kind of getting down on myself about it. I'm like, gosh, man, I've been fasting like 10, 12, 13, 14, 20 Ramadans. And like, look at my character. You know what I mean? Like, there should be like a real 
some type of mark on a person who's done something like that that many times. You know, and when you know what the what the goal of that is. And so I looked at a lot of the things that I was have written, like poems I had written over the years and all, and I noticed that I was always writing these really kind of like dark poems, and I looked at the dates, they were right before Ramadan. So I was like, SubhanAllah, there's like a pattern here. Right before Ramadan, it seemed like I go through something. <laughs> Every single time. And then I realized, okay, like. It just reinforced that there's deep spiritual realities to, to what we're doing here. Spiritually, it is much deeper than just not eating and drinking and so forth. And that's why we have that warning, woe to the one who got nothing from their fast but hunger and thirst. That's all they got out of it. No, it should be something more. But at the same time, that hadith about how Allah took it upon himself to reward for fasting, that gave me some like, okay, I can do this, but don't like beat myself up about it. As a matter of fact, my weaknesses are just a sign of my humanity and the way God made me. You know, that we're going to have these peaks and these dips, you know, it's a roller coaster uh, sometimes. But now I want to share something, inshallah, if you guys don't mind, that I wrote after some time experiencing this fasting thing. As a Muslim, a day of fasting is a day of caution, feeling fatigued from desirous exhaustion. Pass or fail is a matter of the unseen, so struggle I must to keep my record clean. A tune-up for the soul more vital than a car, to clean up a sinful heart encrusted like tar. It's been a little while since I entered this state. I taste a bitter patience during my tasteless wait. The sting of thirst settles in, as well as painful memories of sin. Realizing how much my soul has been ignored. Realizing that true hunger is distance from my Lord. Realizing careless words that cut like a knife. Realizing I have never been truly hungry in my life. Realizing I have much longer to go than I thought. Realizing that purification is not easily bought, but it is a gift for the sick and diseased. It is a gift from a Lord well pleased, like one searching all his life for a lost treasure. Can we survive one second outside of his pleasure? Oh, how I hope that he is pleased with me when I return. How I hope to be shown my mistakes now that I might learn. Learn to draw near like those that draw nearest. Learn to make a place in my heart where his remembrance is dearest. Thoughts crystal clear now to see the ways of error. Reflection upon that great day, its rewards and its terror. Clear is the way of the rejectors who have fled from his light. Clear is the way of the reflectors who flow with insight. Increasing incertitude of the overwhelming event. Increasing in sensitivity to how time is best spent followers of the prophets whose restraint gave them power manifestors of truth satan can't devour O oh, consumers of the illicit no shame in how we're behaving is the permissible not sufficient to satisfy our cravings are you a muslim or a fool accept this invitation to a pool fed by a river whiter than milk sweeter than honey for those whose Lord was God, not sex, food, and money. Rejoicing that the life of this world is a goner. Waiting for that first glance at the one full of majesty, bounty, and honor. How joyful these thoughts, as my heart seems to soften. Surely I sit fast more often. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Something like that, something like that. 
Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Thank you for that 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 feedback. There's many many poems, many songs. Alhamdulillah, that I do hope to compile and share for the sake of Allah, inshallah. Because all of it's about this journey uh, that I'm on and and, the, and that we're on. Yes, I contributed some lines to it. Yeah, with uh, Sheikh Mohammed Mendez too had some some Alhamdulillah. And alhamdulillah, in, in, in summary, I'm saying that to say again, as you can just hear in that poem, it is a very, like, Ramadan is a process, you know, and it's a, it's a deep physical process, but a very spiritual process. And we should, you know, especially as the days, you know, continue in Ramadan, just remind ourselves of those, those aspects of Ramadan. And to remember the hadith for the prophet upon him, be God's blessings and peace said what may be translated as every good deed of Adam's son, the children of Adam, is for him except fasting. It is for me and I shall reward the fasting person for it. Alhamdulillah. So everything in this month, as we know, is multiplied. That's something I like to remember as a person, uh, uh, as a person who likes video games uh, personally. Everything is multiplied. And so I'm always looking at these connection points, try to make these connection points with pop culture or something in, in, in culture in our beautiful faith. And so Ramadan is literally like the, the bonus level, the points multiplier level. Everything is multiplied. So don't feel overburdened by anything. If you feel weak physically, just say something. Just say subhanAllah. And know that it's multiplied. Just say alhamdulillah. And know that it's multiplied. Just say la ilaha illallah. And know it's multiplied. If your mouth is too dry to say anything, just try to squeeze out a smile. Just smile. And the reward of smiling in Ramadan is multiplied. Everything we do, big or small, in Ramadan is multiplied without uh, uh, a limited count because it's with Allah the reward is with him and we know for sure it's multiplied so I'm saying that to remind myself when I feel kind of beat up about Ramadan sometimes and just my head is spinning I'm like come on I run just subhanallah, subhanallah. can't you just say subhanallah? okay mouth is pasty just just go smile at somebody smile at your children smile at your wife Smile at your coworker, or just smile at Allah. Just Allah, alhamdulillah, you know. <laughs> and that's what I wanted to share today. It's all multiplied. May Allah accept uh, from from all of us and multiply our rewards and give us good greetings, good meetings, and at the end of this, good eating, inshallah. Okay? Khalas, did I fulfill the request? Okay. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. That's it for me. Great. Alhamdulillah. Sure, sure. If people. Oh, sure, sure. We can do that. Uh, if anybody wants to take a nap or, you know. The prayer area is so nice and dimly lit over there. It's like asking for a nap. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I wanted to ask you, I, I, me and my sweetheart are having debates over my fasting. He, because I have diabetes, mm -hmm. he says I'm sick and I shouldn't fast. Mm -hmm. I say I can handle this mm -hmm. and I do have the water with my medicines. Right, but right. I am fasting from food, mm -hmm. and so the reason I do this is because I could eat. Mm -hmm. I could say, okay, yeah, I don't like calling myself sick because I don't think of myself as sick. Mm -hmm. I have diabetes. It's mm -hmm. a health condition. Right, right. So I think to myself, if I don't eat, I feel that Allah will be, I, I just have to say it this way, will be proud of me. Mm. You know? That's a deep one. That's a deep one. 
So is your question like kind of what I think about that? Yeah, because like I want to fast and I don't consider myself sick. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Allah will bless me more if I do fast, even though I don't have to. Is that a good way to say it? Yeah, I get it. Thank, well, first of all, disclaimer, you know, no, uh, <laughs> not, not a medical a professional. <laughs> I'm not a uh, Islamic scholarly professional. Um, just your brother. I've learned a few things, and if there's something I have a, a confident understanding of, I'm going to share that. And if I don't, I'll just say I don't know, or I'll say, you know, ask someone here at the MCC, you know, who's more knowledgeable and can get you an answer. Um, but I will say, since you disclosed uh, something very personal, I have diabetes as well. And alhamdulillah, I'm, so far it hasn't prevented me from fasting. But even the most important thing before that is that whether we fast or not, the most important thing is, is just obedience, you know, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, uh, and sometimes a tough word, obedience, you know, submission. But no, but look who we're trying to submit to and be obedient to, like, alhamdulillah, you know. But fasting or your choice to not fast, both of those are be obedience to Allah and they're equal. So if you're choosing to fast and it's sincere, then the, the form of that fast is a specific form. It's refraining from food and drink and water and all that. That's the the fast of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And so if you do that, you are rewarded for that. But that same Lord that decreed that also gave exemptions for that under certain conditions. And you have to get medical help. And you also have to consult your, you know, what you know of your condition. Because no one knows how you feel in actuality but you. So do know that if you don't fast at all, and you're doing that out of knowledge, knowing that Allah himself has given you that exemption, that itself is reward as well. Because you're doing that with knowledge. You're not just saying, oh, I don't feel like fasting. That's different than I can't fast. Or fasting in this way with all of its conditions, meaning fasting from food and drink and the you know, intimate relations and, and so forth, that is the complete fast. To not do that from knowledge, same reward. So don't, again, that was one of my points in, in my present, don't beat yourself up. Because you could also, Allah could be displeased with you taking on a hardship that He didn't put on you. It's something you're doing yourself. All right? And that's really important. And it's something he's, He says about the, the monks, the Christian monks, and concerning monasticism, you know, swearing off, you know, uh, marriage and intimacy, you know, with the spouse. Uh, he says in the Quran, in paraphrase, it's something that they put on themselves. We did not put them on them, and they didn't even fulfill it. Like, they didn't really give it its due. And subhanAllah, don't we see problems? You know, especially in the, in the Catholic community where that's, uh, you know, a dominant practice of the priests and nuns is this celibacy. Allah says they put that on themselves. We did not put them on them, that on them. And they didn't even give it its, its due. So that's a big lesson about, you know, and a, and, a, and, a, and a warning about not putting on ourselves hardships unnecessarily that don't come from the Lord. Because Allah desires ease for us. He desires success for us. Okay? So I hope that helps. It's not a fatwa. You know, it's just something to really think about. Because I want you to take care of yourself physically. And I want you to take care of yourself spiritually. And I want you to have a really healthy, eternal relationship with Allah. I don't want you to burn out. Right? Because some of these things make converts burn out. You know? Like, I can't do this too hard. And they don't realize, no, there's a way out. You know, there's a way, and you taking that is worship and just as much reward. That's a multiplied reward for just obeying him through not harming yourself unnecessarily. So, is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. And thank you for saying that about subhanAllah, because I got nauseous a few times. I didn't know what to say. So thank SubhanAllah. You. Now Allah I know Akbar. what to say. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. Anybody else? Anybody else?
Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Just any type of advice. My struggle uh, with Ramadan, it's not the food, it's not the water, it's lack of sleep. Mm. Because I work. <sighs> and um, I'm a, a, a teacher, so I was. we were fortunate anyone that teaches in school we had this week off this last week was off so we started oh, right. uh, spring break yeah yeah right. spring break yeah. so alhamdulillah alhamdulillah and so i got a chance to sleep in mm. you know a little bit but now when i because i wake up for four um in the morning because i drink water for like an hour before i <laughs> you know every 20 minutes i drink water it's just to get water in my system before i eat so long right. story short there's no going back to sleep Mm -hmm. You know, once the time comes in, um, and so coming home in the evening, sometimes taking a, a, a nap that late in the evening is a challenge. You know, yeah. so right. I don't know. Like, do you have any suggestions? Of, yeah. Yeah. Well, that struggle is real. As they say, the struggle is real. Um, something I've been doing is taking the uh, nap in the car. <laughs> at work and uh, if that's something that you can find a way to do um, that's something I recently started trying let me just get this untangle myself that's something I, I recently uh, started experimenting with is taking a power nap during during work during Ramadan and that's been really really helpful I started doing that this month just last week and it was a big help because the sleep that's a big struggle uh, for myself, too. And I'm sure plenty of others can vouch for that. And besides, like, trying to commit to, to getting up for suhoor, like when you're in the state that, uh, you know, that you're praying, that helps to give you a little bit of energy. So, you know, as opposed to forgetting to wake up for suhoor or missing suhoor, that kind of adds to the, to the struggle. But I would definitely encourage trying to see if you can get a power nap on a break at, at work. You know, take that 30 minutes, or if you're at a job where you have a 30 minute and two 15 minutes, just kind of go somewhere. If there's some place um, in the workplace where you can kind of have a little private corner, you know, just to close your eyes uh, for that period. And if not, um, if you can do that in your car, don't forget to leave the crack in the window. Uh, and um, find a little, some shade or something. Just try taking a nap. And see if that that helps with that. Um, obviously, when you get home, if you have a little time, you know, before breaking the fast, you know, it's 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 obviously encouraged uh, to stay awake during that time, you know, as, as much as possible. Especially in, in general, sleeping after Asr between Asr and Maghrib is discouraged. But in this case, try it. You know, if you got to take another power nap as soon as you get home before you break fast, just don't forget to set an alarm. That happened to me the other night, and I didn't wake up till after midnight. <laughs> and I feel like I missed like the everything. Um, so yeah, and if there's anybody else who you know, this isn't like a, a one-person show. If anybody else has advice, feedback on that, but that's something I've been trying to do now, taking a nap and at work, and that's been really helpful for me personally. Inshallah. Anybody else? Any other? Any, if it's not questions, it could just be thoughts, or, or somebody just wants to take the mic and say Subhanallah. No problem. Allahu Akbar. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum Um, I was thinking because I was like, yeah, it's kind of to keep it on the topic of Ramadan. So, mm -hmm. um, but. I don't know, this is just something, well, two things, like, as a Christian, you know, you know, just speaking to Christian, you know, family, or, you know, about, like, the crucifixion, it's almost like, it, it's so emotional, mm -hmm. and it's like the crux of Christianity, and there's, you can't really speak logically about it, or, you're right, because it's just so emotionally bound to mm -hmm. the Christian paradigm it's what unites all of christians right. too they don't all believe yeah. certain things but that is one exactly. of the things that they're all united on right so it's something that's um how do you you know what i'm saying like i just 
I feel like that's kind of the point. Like, like my mom, for instance, mashallah, she's, she's like amazing. And she actually, she's like, she's like, when I, when I, when I call out to God, I say, Allah, God, you mm-hmm. know, and she believes in the prophet Muhammad. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the crucifixion, it's like, she, she's, she can't let go of it. Right. And so it's just, it's like really amazing. So I'm just kind of wondering from your experience or just in da'wah or, you know what I'm saying? Like, how do we kind of, how do we bridge that in the sense that we know that, that, um, that someone was made to look like Isa Mm -hmm. Mm Salam? you know what I'm saying? So it almost makes sense that they would believe that. Mm -hmm. So kind of what, just from your experience, your perspective on that. Well, one thing is, like I said, sometimes you got to do the, uh, the multiple choice thing that I mentioned. You know, like, if you had a choice, if the choice was yours, that in order for God to forgive you, he had to kill Jesus, who didn't do any of this, or that he could forgive you just by grace. And you making a sincere effort, you saying sorry, you just ask. Sometimes just reducing it down to just a presenting it some type of rational kind of multiple choice, it puts it in a different context. Because ultimately it, it's, it's, it's something that for, for a Christian, that's salvation. You know, myself, when I was uh, starting to read the Quran and read more into it, that was the one issue for me personally. I was like, yeah, I believe God is one. I don't believe Jesus is God. Um, Everything I'm reading, but then when it got to that particular issue that they didn't kill him nor crucified him, only a likeness of that was shown to him. And with no other details, I was, it like put me in like crisis. Like, what am I supposed to do? And then I had to really work through that. Like, well, what does that issue really involve for me? Why do I feel so attached to it? Because it has to do with how we're forgiven, right? And that's one of the gifts of religion is a means of forgiveness, right? Like, how do we right our wrongs? You know, not just there's righting our wrongs that we do from one human to another, right? That, that's one. But then how do we right the wrongs that we do before our creator, right? That has to be like of, like, not prime primary importance, because some, one of the things I, I even learned, this was maybe about a, just a few months ago, this reflection really hit me that we believed in the Ten Commandments, right? As Christians, everybody knows about the Ten Commandments. What's the first one? Right? Exactly. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, which we can easily translate as la ilaha illallah. I said, wow, and don't we believe that God gives a sense of priority to things? So if there's a list of Ten Commandments, why is that the first one? We would say there's intention behind that being the first commandment. And so it made me realize even still, like I said, I've been Muslim for almost 28 years. I'm still learning. And it just hit me recently that, wow, like Islam is reviving the primacy of the first commandment. Right? And that's why Allah says and advises us when we have these discussions with the people of the book, say, come to a word we share between us, which is not whether or not Jesus was crucified, peace be upon him. The word that we share between us is that we both say there's nothing worthy worse of God. We both say there's one God. God is one. And so that caused a shift for me personally just in focus like, Okay, this crucifixion thing, that is an issue. But that has to do with how we rectify our affair with God. But there's this other thing that's even more important. Believe it or not, it's more important than that, which is the very first commandment. If we can agree to that, then let's see what's calling to that in the clearest, most unambiguous manner because once I shifted my like I said I literally became obsessed with this issue of crucifixion I wrote songs I was in the band at that time I have songs about two songs in particular that I wrote 
about this issue of, of the crucifixion. Okay? As a Christian. Right. And so here I am writing a song, but that's how much it like it gripped me, you know, spiritually and theologically that I'm writing about it in a, in a rock song, you know. But again, I had to look at what else is around this. You know what I mean? How am I forgiven? And when I finally got to the verse in the Quran where God talks about sacrifices and how, just like fasting, he's also given rights, sacrificial rights to this community and also other communities. But he says, it's not their meat nor their blood that reaches Allah. It's the piety in your heart. When I read that, I was, I was done with that whole thing. And I was like, okay. Even as, you know, having this understanding that, you know, as a Christian, we were, okay, they we were always being taught he was the sacrificial lamb. He's, you know, the, the Jews used to have, you know, to be forgiven, they had to sacrifice the lambs and animals. And, and then you realize it's actually, there were other things they did. Like, what if you didn't have a, a lamb or a sheep? I mean, you can't be forgiven? No. They had other things. You could use grain, right? Certain types of stocks that you had stored up. Why? Because it really, in, in the sight of God, it's not just ultimately like the verse says. It's not the meat or the blood, or in the, the case in the Jewish tradition, it's not the grain and the wheat that reaches Allah. It's just the sincerity of giving up, sacrificing something of value for Him as a sign that, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm sorry. I am going to give up this thing. You see what I mean? So for me, those types of things are really helpful. And at the end of the day, I would just encourage kind of shifting the emphasis to the first commandment because that's something as a Christian, yes, we know those Ten Commandments, right? Just consider the first one. Why is that the first? The first commandment is not about salvation at all, right? And we have plenty of beautiful and very powerful supporting scripture about the oneness of God and even forgiveness that's attained just by believing that in those who just say, La ilaha illallah, the heaviest thing on the scale, right? We're forgiven even just for saying that. Believing it, obviously in our heart, and saying it, forgiven. And just offer that as the good news. Say, that's our good news. The gospel is the good news. That's the good news. And at the end of the day, we just can present it. And so I'm just trying to share some tools to consider and your next presentation with mom, you know, to say, hey, mom, you know, let's reflect on the, the very first commandment. Because I think maybe we've got sidetracked with some of these other things that are important. And we do that as Muslims, getting to talk about women in Islam and hijab in Islam and jihad in Islam. Start with la ilaha illallah. Islam is the revival of, of the first commandment. That's all. It's it's. It's unambiguous, uncomplicated monotheism at its finest. And we should be proud to have that in this form. So just something to consider. Inshallah. May, and may Allah guide all our parents, you know, our siblings, our cousins. And we should beg for that in Ramadan. You know, I'm talking to myself too. Like, did I pray for my, my mom and dad last night? I didn't, you know. So I'm saying this, this is a reminder. You are reminding me of my mom and my dad, my three brothers and sister, and my grandmother. You know, we got to pray for folks. Don't be stingy with your prayers and just thinking about yourself and your issues and your needs. You know, what about the people? Look at, look at where we're sitting right now. You know, I just was seeing part of this documentary about Skid Row in L.A. and just how exacerbated the homeless situation is there. And subhanAllah, look at where we are. I'm like, that's not me sitting out there like that. I'm sitting here, nice carpet, you know, there, there's food being prepared for me. I'm not even, like, doing, I'm not even cooking the food. It's being prepared for me while I'm sitting on the carpet in the air-conditioned room, you know, in a group of, like, loving, caring believers, people modest. God, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. I had a question. Uh, what's one good thing you could do on any day in Ramadan that's like one really good selfless thing that um, in terms of goodness outweighs like 
all the lesser sins you did throughout mm. like a whole year. Mm. What's one good selfless thing you could do in Ramadan that's just like the the ultimate level up, like right. just super awesome good deed? Right. Right? Is that the question? Right. It's just fast sincere. Just be sincere. Sure. Yeah. Be sincere. Because if you're no matter what you're doing, uh whether it's going outside feeding a thousand people or uh, giving your mom a foot massage, um, giving your dad a back massage. Men are always complaining about their backs. Any of that, which are great things, or donating a large sum of money to the MCC, which I do hope you do in this month. Um, no matter what you do, my good brother, the, the heart of it is sincerity. If you're just focusing on doing the act itself without focusing on why you're doing it and who you're doing it for, doing it for Allah, then there you go. If you just focus on that, being sincere in that I'm doing what I'm doing, because that's what Allah says in the Hadith, whoever fasts the month of Ramadan, sincerely, he could have not said that, right? Why did he? He could have just said whoever fasts Ramadan, right? But he said whoever fasts sincerely. All your sins will be forgiven. So that that's my advice. I want, I want, um, I don't want to tell you anything specific, other than that to do because that's the basis of whatever you decide to do. But right. I want you to take that, uh, that inspiration and be be spiritually creative, and just come up with something that you feel like kind of led to do. You know what I mean? Because we all have our kind of personal interests and leanings. So you kind of tap into yourself and be like, you know, what's something I could do that, that will feel good and that I can do sincerely, even if nobody sees me but Allah. Right. Inshallah. Is that okay? Yes. I had, an I had another question. Um, I've been a student of, uh, of Islam for the past eight years. Oh, wow. And, uh, um, but I've only been a student, and in eight years, like it's enough time to like get a PhD if you're in a <laughs> university. But they, uh, but like, I have no. Um, I've been kind of like hoarding all this knowledge unintentionally, mm. and uh, I've used, acquiring all this knowledge like. Uh, La I, I sort of lack the uh, intention of acquiring the knowledge in the first place, which was to become a teacher of Islam mm. and have students and pass on knowledge of Islam to the next generation mm. and to my peers and my community mm. and any like talib that wants to uh, learn about uh, any like a, a through Z when it comes to Islam. But mm. uh, I've uh, sort of lack any. Um, uh, like I, I rarely come across anybody who who's like uh, uh, like uh, who's a talib, you know, mm -hmm. like any sort. It, there's there's no talib in my life, and I just feel like I'm just selfishly learning all this knowledge, and mm -hmm. and I don't have any sort of like um, foundation or environment to like spread that knowledge in. There's not a lot of people in this country that. Um, cares about you know learning about the quran or arabic or mm -hmm. islamic history mm -hmm. and i just feel like uh unless i had like a phd um i'm not worthy of like ever calling myself a a, a teacher mm -hmm. which has been like uh like a a, a dream like a, a a career dream of mine mm. um and it's created a lot of depression. Like, what do you say, like, to someone who's aspiring to be like a teacher, but um, has to stay a student in hopes of like obtaining a dream that, you know, la qadr Allah may not come true. Mm. Man. So you're, if I understand what what, what you asked uh, correctly, you you have an interest to be a student of knowledge. Right, and you. It sounds like what you're trying to do is study Islam systematically, right? Like not just internet Islam, or you know, like you would like to study Islam systematically, which I'm doing. Okay, are you studying? Is it with a teacher, or do you? you it's just through books that have been recommended, or through you've both done? books and university professors, and books from recommended by university professors, and. Um, uh, accredited people 
Right. So it sounds like what it sounds like a, a missing ingredient is just like a dedicated Islamic studies teacher, like a Muslim, no, like, like like that. I'm. I've hoarded so much knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't. I don't claim I know everything. Right. Right. I don't right. claim I know everything. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel like will I, will I ever know enough to be able to like teach what I know? Because there's no point in like learning right. from from you know professors and mm -hmm. scholars and reading books if um, you're just going to keep all that knowledge inside your head, never yes. let it out, and then like never share it with anyone and then die and then all that knowledge goes to your grave yeah. so what like this is like an existential fear of mine mm -hmm. um, what what advice do you have like about like uh, for like giving hope to anyone who like wants to um, uh, like spread Islamic knowledge um, through uh, just means um, to like uh, a anyone like if a I don't know like um uh, this is like a like a like a duty of mine. Like some people like to say mm -hmm. dawa, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or some people would say be a university professor. But mm -hmm. like the road has been like very long, and um, almost it. at the end of it. Got it. Inshallah, but I cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel, unfortunately. Got it. Got it. Well, there's there's probably a lot at play with a you know there's a a lot of dynamics uh, uh, involved. It was a question like that. Uh, number one, it's 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 a great question. Like you should be happy to even be concerned with something like that. I think that's uh, you should take that as a very hopeful sign or a sign to put hope in that you even care about the religion, right? Seriously, like you should be like take that as a good sign that you actually care about the religion. Number two, that you care about the religion enough that you want to learn more about it. So that's the second thing you should be hopeful about. Also, remember, you know, and I think that's been a, a theme, you know, that I'm seeing in, in this presentation I've tried to offer is not beating yourself up and overburdening yourself, right? Because Allah doesn't do that to us. He doesn't overburden us. Or be, a lot of this are burdens with things we're doing to ourselves, okay? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us in this regard, uh, what may be translated as convey from me even if one verse convey from me like convey uh, this knowledge that we have that's been revealed through the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him even if it's one verse wallow ayah even just one verse so it's not a don't don't look at your pursuit of knowledge and in particular your sharing of knowledge don't look at it as this cumulative thing always break things back to their essentials because if you're always looking at the big things that you desire you'll miss what's been right next to you and that's why you have to work with first your sphere of influence and identify your sphere of influence and your sphere of concern your sphere of concern is probably the whole world Right? We care about humanity. We care about this thing happening over here and this thing happening over there. But a lot of times, over-obsessing about our sphere of concern or our realm of concern makes us miss our sphere of actual influence, which is our families, co-workers, neighbors. We're so thinking about what's happening here and there, and we miss the brother sitting right next to you to your left. You see what I mean? You forget to give him a salam and a good greeting and smile on his face. and You see what I mean? Those little things. And that's done out of knowledge, right? But sometimes overthinking, about, you know, overcomplicating, we miss these little things. You know? And so that's something I'm very you know, particular about is those little things. And, and in particular, out of the things to study, give some priority to the study of uh, the character aspects of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. A book specifically, The Content of Character. The Content of Character uh, is a book by, by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf that he translated that is one of my top favorite books personally because it's just a, a translation of a compilation of just 
character-centric hadith that narrated authentically from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that are like so readily, like they're accessible and like doable. Inshallah. Yeah. And so that, I'm just saying that to, to not um, tell you exactly what to do, but also tell you a good focal point of what you're trying to do. Be sincere and focus on those essential, simple things, even if it's one verse. But specifically, don't forget about your sphere of influence, which is those more direct people in your life. And your interaction with those direct people should be the knowledge your, your, that that interaction should be based on is the beautiful character traits of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, not the do's and don'ts. The da'wah doesn't start, the, the call and the invitation to people does not start with telling them what they can't do and what they have to start doing. It's reminding them that they have a creator, number one, right? And then to take on beautiful prophetic character traits and that there's healing and there's beauty and there's light in that. And that's, that's my advice for that. Jazakallah khair. The content of character is both. Uh, well, it's an English book, but it has the Hadiths are in Arabic and English. So, yeah, it's a pure English book, but for the Hadith, they do have them in Arabic and English. Uh, I'm sorry, did you, you're, you're, did you have something to say? I'm totally not trying to diss my man there. Okay. So sorry, brother. Uh, we are. It is time for Maghrib. Allahu yeah. Akbar. Mashallah. So we went the whole Take time. Take beer. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. <laughs> May Allah bless you, brother. Arun. May Allah. <laughs> Beautiful. It just flew by the time. Alhamdulillah. Allah bless you. Allahu Akbar. So it's a very precious time right now. Please pray for your brother before mm -hmm. you break your fast. And yes. pray for all this community. Pray for everyone here.